Welcome. We are. We just want to tell you thank you so much for coming. It was quite the trek getting here this morning. So, and we know that everybody has busy schedules. So, we just want to tell you how really truly honored we are to be able to have your attention for a little while this morning. As Vicky was saying, we have been spending the last um, five years, I think, educating people about ACEs because we're really excited about that. I think we're somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 people um, at this point, and it's truly one of the things that Harry and I love to do the most. Um, a little housekeeping issue. We are going to be talking about trauma today, and so we really want to encourage everyone to be mindful of um, their own responses. And if something that we say or something that anyone says today um, really stirs some things up for you, please be, please be aware of that, and we just invite you to take really good care of yourself. And so if that means that you need to step out for a few minutes, take a walk, call a friend, look at pictures on your iPhone, do something to take care of yourself, and we would so appreciate uh, your doing that. Um, I think that's the only housekeeping thing we have, right? Mm -hmm. I believe, okay. Click. So I want you to just to imagine that tomorrow morning when you wake up, on the news is a story that says that a toxic substance has been identified and that exposure to this substance significantly increases your risk of heart disease, lung disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity. At the same time, it increases your risk of um, not graduating from school, high school, uh, dropping out, teen pregnancy, um, involvement with the criminal justice system, drug and alcohol addiction. Simultaneously, it decreases your risk of gainful employment through your adult life and finding and participating in a long-term, satisfying, intimate relationship. If we had identified a substance like that, can you imagine? I mean, this is bigger than tanning beds. This is bigger than texting and driving, right? This is huge. It would be on the cover of every newspaper. It would be the headline news. And yet, something has been identified that does all of those things and so much more, right? It's just not a toxic substance, it is trauma. And so we're really excited to be here today because we get the opportunity to talk to you about trauma and its impact. So um, definition of trauma that we like to use is that trauma is not an event. It is a response to a, a, an experience that dramatically overwhelms a person's ability to cope. So oftentimes it's sudden, unexpected. It's always perceived by that person to be dangerous, often life-threatening, um, but Particularly, it takes away a person's sense of power and control, leaving them to feel helpless and um, unable, to, unable to care for themselves. So that sense of helplessness, that sense of loss of power and control, is really a big piece of any traumatic experience. So we want to show you a, a little video. We used to spend about 45 minutes um, talking about this part of um, our presentation, but we found this video. How many people have seen the Apes' Primer? Very few people, great. This will tell you in five minutes what we used to spend 45 telling you about. <laughs> Here's 
and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. As Audrey said, we're delighted to be here. We have been doing this for a very long time, and so we know that some of you have heard this material before. Um, one of the reasons that I really enjoy doing this, even though we probably taught this material in one form or another a hundred times, is that Audrey is my little sister, and I really enjoy the opportunity to be able to um, to teach with her. The other reason that I enjoy doing this is because even the people that have heard this before tell us, boy, I heard it again and I learned some new things. There comes a point as we learn about trauma when a light bulb turns on in our minds 
and everything begins to really make sense. We look around us and we see problems like alcoholism, drug abuse, suicide, and the light bulb goes on and reminds us this is trauma. I remember when um, I first was introduced to the eastern redbud tree, and um, beautiful tree early in the spring. Driving to Florida, um, I realized there were eastern redbud trees everywhere. And my wife and I were saying, there's one, there's one, there's one. And the more you understand about trauma, the more you'll see problems, the more you'll see people and say, oh, trauma, it's trauma. We have in your packet a copy of the same 10 questions that Dr. Anda and Dr. Felitti used in the landmark ACEs study. And while you're grabbing that, let me just mention, as you saw, Dr. Anda was, um, is a doctor from the Center for Disease Control and have been dealing with things like Ebola and AIDS, some fairly major problems. And Dr. Anda said that when he saw the results of the ACEs study, he said, when I saw the results, I wept. So let's see what your A score is. Um, if you had that out and pens were generously given to us, I'd ask you to look through those 10 questions and for each question, there's a line under it, and you can put one of two answers. If that thing happened to you at any point in the first 18 years of your life, you'll put a one, regardless of whether it happened to you one time or a dozen times, it's just a yes or no answer. If it did happen, you put a one. If it did not happen, you put a zero. And when you're done, you'll tally up your answers. And when you look up, we'll know that you're finished and that you're still awake. Okay, thank you for doing that. Um, what we know is that um, among the general population, the average A score is somewhere between two and three. I think we use um, 2.3. What we also have found out, though, is that people in helping fields, like yourselves, tend to have higher A scores than the general population. I think those of us who have hurt are interested in helping. All trauma is not created equal. Um, there are three kinds of trauma that we want to address real briefly. The first one is acute trauma. Acute trauma is a single event that is limited in time. Um, an example of that would be a car accident where you may be hurt badly, um, you may have thought, oh my goodness, my life is over as you slid toward the other car or toward the tree, um, but there weren't lasting physical complications from that. Um, another example would be a fire or another or a natural disaster. The second kind of trauma is chronic trauma, and we don't mean chronic. Chronic trauma, um, which is the um, continual or the um, repeated experience of trauma. For example, I mentioned the car accident earlier. If as a result of that car accident, um, you lost a family member, that would be a complication. That would be a second layer of trauma. If you were in a body cast for six months, that's not just a simple acute trauma. 
um, it becomes more complicated. The third kind of trauma that we want to talk about, um, we're calling here toxic stress. Another way to explain that is developmental trauma. This is trauma that has three characteristics. First of all, it generally begins very early in life. Secondly, it's something that's repetitive, or it may be continual. And third, it is something that often occurs to a child at the hands of the very people whose job it is to take care of the child. An example of that um, would be what? What happens to children often begins early, it continues to happen, and happens at the hands of their caregivers. Okay, abuse, neglect, and in spite of the fact that um, for example, experiences in warfare leave people with PTSD. Um, the experience of being in foster care leaves children with the experience of or the problem of having PTSD in about the same numbers. In spite of the, the pain associated with PTSD, um, we believe that the most difficult, the most painful, the most debilitating kind of trauma is this toxic stress or developmental trauma. We're going to see um, another video and because I don't trust this to work with the clicker, I'm going to give Audrey the microphone and I'm going to go down to the projector. This, I think, is just an illustration. It's our favorite il illustration of what toxic stress looks like for children. Brain architecture, 
the body. Toxic stress can cause serious health problems later in life. These are things that are like pervasive, uh, typically very uncontrollable and unpredictable. Uh, abusive relationships, poverty, um, loss of job, loss of social status, things like this which are kind of beyond our control and are very pervasive in our life and really kind of have this detrimental effect on us. Toxic stress can weaken developing brain architecture and damage other body systems in young children. The effects can be a lifetime of health challenges, including physical and mental health problems and even addiction. To ensure a healthier future for our families and communities, we need to work together to support caregivers and children, prevent toxic stress, and provide the kinds of nurturing experiences that build healthy brains and bodies. So we've made the connection that when stress happens in children's lives, particularly when it is repetitive, and when there are not adults to buffer the stress, this can have these long-lasting impacts. But how is it that something, how many of you heard, have heard or maybe have even said, children are resilient, right? We've, we've all said that or we've all heard that, right? And, it, and there's a lot of truth to that. Children are resilient, people are resilient if there are certain things in place. And for children, one of those are those buffering, supportive relationships. Um, but how is it that what happens during the first 18 years of your life can impact whether you get cancer at age 35, or whether you turn to alcoholism at 40? What is the mechanism by which early childhood events can impact our lifetime, our health and well-being during our lifetime? This diagram helps us to really understand that. Basically, if we start at the bottom and we look at there's adverse childhood experiences, as we just heard in that video, these adverse childhood experiences change the structure, have the potential to change the structure and the functioning of the developing brain. Now, trauma that happens to you at 40 can certainly be traumatic and can certainly have big impacts. It won't have the same impact, though, because your brain is not developing like it is during those first 18, actually 24 years of your life. So while that brain is developing, early childhood experiences impact the, the structure and the development of that brain. When that happens, that then certainly can have an impact on a person's social, emotional, and cognitive well-being. If you start kindergarten and you're not ready to start kindergarten because your body has been pumping all of its resources into survival rather than learning, kindergarten is not going to be a fun place for you to be, right? How many of you heard the statistics on the kids that are getting expelled from daycare? It's horrible right? Because we've got more and more kids who are going who are not ready to be there and learn. So brain development then impacts cognitive, social, and emotional well-being. When that occurs, people are not feeling well, and they can turn to health risk behaviors, things such as drugs, alcohol, um, uh, many sexual partners, things that make you feel better in the moment, but that have long-term health consequences. When that happens, then the increase in disease um, significantly increases. And lastly, um, 20 years. You heard, uh, I think in the primer, it talked about people with an ACE score of six on average have 20, die 20 years earlier due to that cumulative effect. Okay, so let's talk just a little bit. We don't want to go into too much brain stuff here, but we want to talk just a little bit more about the um, cognitive, the um, neurodevelopmental piece of this. So imagine that you're walking along. You're on a hike. It's better weather than it is today. So you're outside. You're hiking around. And suddenly, you hear rustling in the bushes. And suddenly, you encounter this guy. And so, boom, right? Heart rate speeds up. You are terrified. I would be terrified. I saw a bear once. He was uh, actually in our basement, <laughs> and it scared the snot out of me. So um, he stuck his head in. I was in there. He just stuck his head in. But it was scary. 
So what happens when this happens? Our body does this phenomenal response, phenomenal response. So we don't even have to ask it to, right? Suddenly, we go into fight flight. So our body starts to produce all these, there's actually 1,400 stress chemicals that begin to pump into our body. Cortisol starts, increases our blood pressure, decreases, makes our blood um, go to our heart and leave our extremities. So if the bear bit you in the arm, you'd be less likely to die as quickly, right? So all of these things are happening. Adrenaline is released in huge amounts to give you the ability, the energy to fight uh, that bear if you chose to do that, or run, which is probably the better idea. So fight or flight. Liver stops, digestion slows down. All of these wonderful things happen to get you ready to survive, to fight or flight. So the part of the brain that is involved in this is what we call the amygdala, the survival or the reacting brain. This is the part that sends the alarm out that says, uh-oh, we are in big trouble here. And that's what starts that whole chemical process happening. Sends the alarm helps us to survive in that moment, right? Center part of the brain, the, uh, it's actually the limbic system part of the brain, sends out the alarm, okay? What that does, let's just say you're back in that situation, you're seeing that bear. Probably in that moment, you did not s take the time to think about, hmm, is this a brown bear or a black bear? What do I know about climbing trees and brown bears? Do they climb trees? No. What do I know about how fast bears run? No, you are not thinking anything, right? Thank goodness, because what would happen if you would stop to consider all of these variables? You would be eaten. But you don't stop and think about it because when that happens, your brain shuts off the prefrontal cortex, part of your brain, the thinking part of your brain, which allows you just to react in that moment. Because if you were to use this part of your brain, probably would not be in your best interest. So look at what this part of your brain does, though. It's planning. It's impulse control. It's weighing consequences to a behavior. It allows you to evaluate things. It's all of that higher level thinking, executive functioning. Shuts off in that moment in order to save your life. But what happens if, and, and this system works incredibly well when it happens infrequently. I don't see bears very often. Hopefully you don't either. So this system is wonderful and it's primed for situations that happen really, really infrequently. But what if um, the stressor isn't a bear, but it's a father or a mother with a temper problem and with an abuse problem? So this system in your body is getting turned on over and over and over again. And now, Instead of just turning on when there is a real threat, it starts to become trigger-wired to turn on very quickly, even at the thought of the threat or an inkling of the threat. And for some children, it turns on and it doesn't turn off. Now, what did we say about what's going on with the executive functioning, the learning part of our brains? It's turned down, it's turned off. Right? So how about if you're a child in math class and you need to be thinking about math right now? That's the, that's the prefrontal cortex part of your brain, right? And let's just say that your math teacher wears the same cologne as your father. And every time you're in math, boom, 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 and you're not able to think, right? And so for some of these children, this is happening over and over and over and over again. Their heart rates are up. Their blood pressure is up. They are living this over and over and over again throughout their day, right? And it has a huge impact. So because this exposure of this chronic exposure, they may be experiencing um, situations that you and I would say are not dangerous, but they experience them as high threat, life and death throughout the day. And I know what I feel like when I'm scared. It's not a pleasant feeling. Right? And imagine feeling that over and over and over, or kind of continuously.
So one of the big impacts is that when children are experiencing this level of activation, all of their resources that should be being going toward things like learning, things like developing social skills, are being shunted toward survival. And their brains and their bodies are really being shunted toward, all of that energy gets shunted toward, uh, toward survival, and it's not being sent toward development in the same way as a child who's not, right? So they end up with these big gaps in their social, emotional, cognitive development. We want to touch real briefly on several of the areas that are deeply impacted by trauma. One of those is the cognitive area, and that presents children with a number of challenges in the area of learning. 30% um, of abused children have some kind of language or cognitive impairment. You can read the others, they are in your notes. Let me just point out a statistic that I heard just this week. A teacher was telling me that um, normally they have about 15% of their students coming in that are already identified as special education, whether emotionally or as far as learning. The teacher told me that this coming year, already identified in the student body coming in, they have 40% of the students identified as special education. Can you imagine? 22% um, of abused children have a learning disorder. So one of the things that happens as a result, as Audrey said, of that brain being stuck in the fight flight mode um, is that there are cognitive issues. Also, it affects children's interpersonal and emotional lives. Um, it's really important that we understand that relationships are key, whether we're talking about what causes trauma or what helps build resistance and resilience to trauma. People are hurt in relationships, and people are also healed in relationships. Um, people who have a trauma history that's significant, particularly those people with developmental trauma, the toxic stress that we talked about, have issues recognizing and sharing their feelings effectively. If you've been around these children and asked them, what are you feeling? You may just see a blank look on their faces because they're not sure what they're feeling, but they're feeling a lot of it. Difficulty trusting others. Difficulty taking another person's perspective. So when someone asks, Susie, what do you think Alice was feeling when you smacked her in the head with the block? Susie probably doesn't know what Alice was feeling because she can't put herself in Alice's shoes. Difficulty enlisting other people as allies and difficulty reading cues from other people. The very heart of relationships and these kids are impaired in those areas. Threats to emotional well-being, two huge obstacles. One of them is the ability to regulate their emotions. Um, babies are born without that ability to regulate and self-soothe. Uh, my daughter, just in the last few weeks, had a baby boy. And I had the opportunity to spend some time with him and I just enjoyed that really deeply. Being a granddad is one of my uh, greatest experiences. But the little rascal is not very good at controlling his emotions. And so 
what we do as adults is we lend that baby our regulated emotional system. And so I snuggled him and I patted his little back. And I don't dance well, but I was dancing around. I was rocking. I was talking to him quietly because babies don't have the ability to take themselves from panic back down to a calm state of mind. Kids who have developmental trauma, toxic stress, may never develop that ability. And so we see kids that are much older that just don't have the ability to soothe themselves, to calm down. Secondly, it puts children at a much higher risk for the whole plethora of psychological, of mental health issues and diseases. Um, Dr. Bruce Perry talks about um, one of the big areas that we've mentioned, child abuse. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual? I used to know how many pages were in it because we used to use this slide more frequently. There's a lot. Dr. Perry says that if child abuse were to end today, the jails would be empty and the DSM would be the size of a pamphlet. Another one, we decided we didn't have time to use this, but it may have been um, a subconscious decision on my part. Uh, it got left in, so we have to use it, right? Um, Dr. Dean Ornish is the director of a program that deals with prevention in physical health issues. So he ought to know what he's talking about, about what makes a difference. And, and we know a lot of the risk factors we hear about. We need to exercise more. We need to stop smoking. We need to eat better, on and on. Dr. Ornish says, love and intimacy are at the root of what makes us sick and what makes us well. If a new medication had the same impact, Failure to prescribe it would be malpractice. I'm not aware of any other factor in medicine. Not diet, not smoking, not exercise, not genetics, not drugs, not surgery that has a greater impact on the quality of our life. Love and intimacy. Okay, I'm kind of out of breath after that, so I, th I think I'm going to give my sister the microphone. So we just um, listed a number of diagnoses um, that we frequently see that are um, associated with trauma. Let's just think about the fact, if you are got a lot of adrenaline running in your system and your heart rate's up, and you have an um, inability to focus because you've got lots of adrenaline and cortisol running through your system, you have difficulty focusing, you have difficulty sitting still, uh, you have difficulty interacting, uh, what might your diagnosis be if you're a child? ADHD, yes. How about if you, um, the other way that trauma often looks, so one way is to have all of that excess energy, irritability, anger, a lot of energy. Another way that people respond when they've got that system going is that they go the other way. They go into more of a freeze mode. And so instead of excess energy, what they have is they are shut down. They are shut off. This is the child with the hoodie up, right? They're not looking at you. They're disengaged. So let's just think about those two faces of trauma, and then let's look at these diagnoses, right? So you mentioned ADHD. And just by, for um, point of argument, 
What do we do when kids get diagnosed with ADHD? We medicate them, don't we? Yes, we do. And then if one medication doesn't work, what do we do? We give them another one, sure. But let's look at each of these and think about how trauma may actually be at the root of these diagnoses, right? Someone who's shut off, who's not engaged, who's not talking, who's not doing much, may very well get diagnosed with major depression. And they may very well be depressed, right? A child who can't trust adults in their life to make decisions because the adults have not been trustworthy may be a child that gets diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. And what does that mean? I'm going to move into the adult role because I can't trust adults to do it well. So I'm going to come up and be an adult. I'm going to come up and take on that role because adults can't do it well. I've had that experience. And so um, oppositional defiant disorder. Somebody who flips back and forth from excessive energy to shut down. Excessive energy to shut down. What might we be diagnosed with? Bipolar disorder, right? And what I'm not saying is that these um, diagnoses don't exist outside of trauma. Certainly they do. On the other hand, if we look at them and we don't see that, that trauma is a piece of it, what are we going to do? We're going to medicate the symptoms, and our, our treatment plans are not going to really get at the heart of what's going on, right? And so I'm a psychologist. I've spent a lot of years diagnosing people, and now to know that the di diagnoses I've given probably did not encompass um, um, a big piece of what was fueling that diagnosis. And if we don't treat the trauma, if we just treat the symptoms, we're never going to get there, are we? No. Okay. Um, we just uh, think this, this is an important statistic. Uh, the U.S. has 75 million children. 40.4 million are on psychotropic medications, according to the Wall Street Journal. 40.4. Now, we need to tell you that they included asthma medications in there and anti-seizure medications. So some of those children may not be taking them for um, um, mental health reasons. But I don't care. Let's just take those out of there. Th look at that statistic. Is that not terrifying? And again, if we are not treating the trauma that is fueling this, if we are just giving them medication or treating those symptoms, we're missing the boat. So trauma also has a, a physical health and societal impact. Just real quickly, because I know um, this has been shown before in the uh, Nadine Burke Harris's t uh, TED Talk, but 10 leading causes of death and disability in the United States, and as your ACE score goes up, so does your risk of each of those types of um, uh, death or, or, I'm sorry, disability or illness. So Alzheimer, diabetes. Think of the amount of money that we spend on diabetes in the United States, right? Think of the amount of money we spend on obesity, heart disease, lung disease, right? And knowing that trauma is a big piece of this. In the United States, 33 cents out of every healthcare dollar is going to directly treat the impact of trauma. We are never going to solve health care unless we solve trauma. Also has a big serious societal impact. Look at those outcomes. Look at those potential outcomes. Think about, I think about um, uh, San Francisco and the homelessness rate there, right? The homelessness really across the United States. That's just one of those problems. And so it's a tragedy both for the people who are living it Right? And as a society, what this is doing to our society. So homelessness, inability to keep a job, long-term use of health services, long-term use of criminal justice services. Um, uh, and as your ACE score goes up, your likelihood of, in, of uh, having one of those negative outcomes also goes up. So what happens when life is this hurtful and harmful? Um, what is it that people do to cope? What do you do when life is stressful? Some people have some coping skills out there. Anyone want to tell us what your coping skill is? 
Pray. Yes. Good. Great. What else? Work out. Exercise. Yay. Cook. Yes. Oh, I'm coming to your house. Good. <laughs> now we'll go exercise with her. Okay, good. Cooking, praying, exercise. One more. Go shopping, retail therapy. All right, good. Lots of, uh, we noticed that no one mentioned any of their negative coping skills, did they? Right? <laughs> so coping skills. But the truth is, is when we're hurting, we need to do something to take care of that hurt, right? And if you're an ex a person who's experienced a lot of trauma, you're hurting a lot. So we just want to tell you a little story to illustrate this point. Let's imagine that a man is walking along a river, and it's a raging, you know, the Yakagani kind of thing. It's really moving fast, right? It's really going. Beautiful river. And he slips. Just as he's, he's admiring the river, he slips and falls in. And this guy cannot swim. So he's in there, and he's getting rushed down the river, and he can't swim. So he's getting banged up because he's hitting all the rocks, and he's under the water, and he can't get any air. And his lungs are, ex are just killing him. They feel like they're burning up. He gets a gulp of air, but then he's right back under, and now he can't breathe. He can't breathe. And now he thinks the end is near. He's going to die. This is it. And suddenly, out of nowhere, he reaches and he feels a log. And there's a log that is going down the river with him. And it's just big enough that he's able to hold on just enough that he can get his nose and his mouth up and he's able to breathe. And he's holding on for dear life. And suddenly, he gets um, jettisoned off into this pond. He, all of a sudden, he's in the pond. He's in the middle of the pond. He can't believe it. He's huffing. He's puffing. He's still holding on. And there are people on the shore, and they see him out there, and they call out to him, and they say, hey, buddy, buddy, look, it's not that deep. Let go of your log. You can walk in. You're going to be okay. Just let go of the log. Come on. He's in there. He's not letting go of his lock, right? He's holding on for dear life. What needs to happen in this situation? You're on the shore. You're one of those people on the shore. What needs to happen next? Somebody needs to walk out and get him. Yes, they need to get him and help him come into the shore, maybe log and all, right? He's not going to let go of that log because that log, what? Saved his life. He is not going to let go. One of the things that we want to point out is that many of the people who have experienced trauma have a log. They have something that, and, and certainly these are costly coping mechanisms. But they have coping mechanisms that perhaps help them to survive when pain was just intolerable and unbearable, right? And we want to look at a couple of those coping mechanisms. Yes. Um, some of you probably heard the story about a hiker who um, cut off his own arm with a jackknife and broke the bone with a rock. And he chose to do that. Why did he make that choice? To survive. His arm was trapped under a boulder, and it was either cut and bash off his own arm or die there in the mountains. People make some difficult and sad choices sometimes because um, it's the only way that they can see to take away the pain for a little while, or maybe forever. Nadine Burke Harris mentioned um, the statistic of suicide, and under some circumstances, that being four times as high. Among children with an A score of seven, the incidence of attempted suicide is 
50 times as high. 50 times. Among, um, I work some with people who are addicted to um, drugs, and among young men who have an ACE score of six, they are more likely to use IV drugs. Not twice as likely, not 10 times as likely, 46 times as likely to use IV drugs. Do you think that we're going to solve the problems of heroin and fentanyl if we don't understand trauma? Here's a list of some of those costly coping mechanisms. Um, smoking, obesity, suicide attempts, we mentioned alcohol and drugs, 50 or more sexual partners, and we'd be surprised to know how many people are quite that friendly. Um, repeating the original trauma, again, it replicates itself from generation to generation. Self-injury and eating disorders, and again, the higher the A score, the higher the incidence of these is. We have more people who do get sick as an adult, right? We have a lot of judgment about that. We don't see that as the reason for the problem. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
have to mention, it's so interesting um, presenting with a ADHD brother. Um, when we were children, we were in a car accident, and um, we were, our family was hit by a drunk driver. And um, my, our parents were killed, and he and I were both really injured. Um, so that was a pretty traumatic event. But he was one of those cases where he was ADHD long before <laughs> um, that, that occurred. It's always interesting because you never have an, any clue where he's going. You know, we, ha we know exactly, we have done this many, many times. We always have it kind of planned out ahead, but you never know. So it's always exciting because he's talking about things that I have no idea where he's going to end up. So always keeps us on our toes. So. We're going to talk now, we get to spend the last 10 minutes talking about what can we do? Because we've given you all the bad news, right? We've talked about all the serious impact, but here's the good news, right? There is something, like um, they said earlier, um, ACEs are not destiny. There's a, we have an ability to impact this by changing that balance between risk and resilience, decreasing risk increasing factors that support resilience. So what can we do? We can become a trauma-informed, and I would even say a trauma-responsive individual, organization and system, or, and or community. So what does that look like? This is SAMHSA's definition of what a person, program, organization, or system looks like. It, it realizes the impact of trauma. Hopefully by the end of today, you have a much better understanding or more full understanding about the impact of trauma. It also understands that recovery is possible, that people don't have to have those outcomes that we've talked about. People do, can, and do recover from trauma that we as individuals recognize what the signs and symptoms are and so that we are not seeing um, things as bad behaviors or character flaws when maybe they're trauma responses. We also actively resist re-traumatization. We just want to spend one second talking about what re-traumatization is. A conscious or unconscious reminder of past trauma that results in re-experiencing of the initial trauma event be triggered by a situation or attitude or expression or by certain environments that replicate the dynamics. Remember I talked in the very beginning about loss of power and control of the original trauma. I had a woman that told me that she was 70 years old. When she was a child, she was a young child, she was sexually abused. She told her mother, and her mother did not want to hear it, and so her mother didn't hear it when she told her, really totally kind of ignored her. Never told another soul. At the age of 70, she went for a mental health evaluation, not in this county, I'll say. And at the, the intake worker was taking her, um, her history, and she asked her if she was ever raped or sexually abused. And the woman had the courage to say, yes, I was. And the intake worker said nothing and went on to the next question. Can you see how in so many ways that replicated exactly what had happened to her as a child? Another example is um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Anna, what's Anna? Jen Jenix. Jenix. Um, talks about her daughter had been sexually abused as a child by a babysitter. As an adolescent and an adult, she was hospitalized many times on inpatient psychiatric units. And she does this comparison in which she talks about how the um, child molester held her daughter down as a child to um, molest her. In the inpatient unit, she was held down. She was put into restraints. The child molester stripped her and took her clothes off. On the inpatient unit, when she, they were giving her shots of Haldol, they stripped her and um, gave her those shots. And she goes back and forth and back and forth and shows how unintentionally, but how much that psychiatric unit replicated the very trauma that that person had. I have for years, when a new client came into my office, I, not ever thinking about it, I shut the door behind us. Because of course they want confidentiality, right? Never thinking that for some people walking into a room with a stranger they don't know, and having the door closed behind them was really 
hard for them. Now I ask my clients, and it amazes me how many clients tell me, no, please leave the door open just ajar a little bit. Never thought to ask. So we can become um, trauma-informed and avoid all the small ways that we may actually be re-traumatizing and harming the people we so very much want to help. We can, as an individual, we can do all of these things. Remember self-care. We can learn about trauma. Acesconnection.com, uh, that work? Acesconnection.com, wonderful website. You can get your PhD just learning from acesconnection.com, all about trauma. Developing our trauma lens so that rather than saying, what's wrong with you, we begin to ask people, what happened to you? And seeing seeing their behavior, seeing their signs and symptoms through that trauma lens. We can get involved, and this afternoon we're going to talk a lot about ways for you to get involved. Dr. Benson, Peter Benson, we love him, he says, every child is one caring adult away from being a success story. You want to talk about something? If you want to invest in your life, invest in a child, right? Each of us has the ability to invest in a child, one caring adult away from being a success story. Trauma-informed organizations, SAMHSA says these are the six characteristics of a trauma-informed um, organization or system. I'll tell you, this is not a short thing. This is a lot of work, right? When you begin to look at every policy, every procedure, every action, every interaction, epitomizing these six characteristics it's not a, uh, this is not a one-year project, right? <laughs> this is a lot of work. But boy, talk about wonderful um, potential for change and for outcomes. Yes, and Bernice, Bernice um, Leonard from uh, Parkside has helped um, a number of organizations, uh, drug and alcohol, um, mental health, um, children and youth services in Crawford and Erie counties. Um, Ju juvenile probation in Crawford and Mercer counties, um, working on this process. Yes, uh, a number of schools, we've gotten to um, train 1,500 teachers, bus drivers, um, to uh, um, help them on this journey of becoming trauma-informed. It's a process, right? But talk about wonderful outcomes. Communities. Communities also can become trauma-informed. Um, whole communities, and we're going to hopefully talk about ways that this community um, can start on that journey. Um, a number of places already have, this is a, a across the nation, right? A state of Alaska, the entire state of Alaska is working on becoming trauma-informed. State of Wisconsin, um, state of Montana, whole states have these efforts of becoming tra a trauma-informed state. We just mentioned a few Peace for Tarpon. There are mentors. We went to uh, Florida in the middle of winter a number of years ago and looked at Peace for Tarpon. They have a wonder. They are the um, billed as the first trauma-informed community in the United States. It's on the Gulf Coast. If you need a place to go in like February, it's a great place to go. There's Erie's uh, Coalition for a Trauma-Informed Community, Peace for Crawford, Crawford County. Um, Kansas City, Philadelphia, this is the Thrive is the state of Vermont. So lots of trauma-informed um, community efforts underway and, and having really great results. You know, if we're going to take on some of those risk factors like poverty, like child abuse, you know, one organization can't do it. But if organizations can um, band together, then we have the ability to change. Yes, and Mercer County is there, right. So there's our take-home messages. ACEs are surprisingly common. They have a profound effect 50 years later. They transform the psychosocial experience into physical disease, social dysfunction, and mental illness. They are the main determinants of the health and well-being of our nation. And ACEs aren't destiny. We can tip the balance from risk to resilience. And we have two minutes. Can we show our video? Yeah. We're going to show our little video. It's, we love it. So we're going to show it too. And I, uh, I get tearful every time we show this video. I've probably seen it 50 times, but I still get a, a little misty.
Thank you.